What can we expect to happen in the world in the next 12 months? In order for me to answer this question, let me give some background so that you will understand the rest of the story. The year was 1984. I was in my house in Kosilov, Alaska, where I was living at the time. The phone rang. On the other end of the phone was an oil company official. He said to me, he said, Chaplain, how you doing? I said, fine. I said, I haven't talked to you for a while. He said, by the way, are you going to be doing any speaking engagements in the next uh, few weeks? I said, yes. I begin in Seattle, Washington on next week and wind up in Southern California about two months later. He said, well, would you like everybody in your audiences to think that you're a prophet? Well, I said, what do you mean? He said, tell them that the price of crude oil is going from $32 a barrel to $10 a barrel. Well, it was $32 a barrel at that time. And I said, that can't happen. It would literally devastate the Arab world. He said, Chaplain, it's going to. Well, I did. I knew this man. I knew he knew what he was talking about. Because after all, it's all planned. So I said, okay. And I did. Beginning the next week in Seattle, Washington, I said the price of crude oil is going from $32 a barrel to $10 a barrel. My audiences literally burst out in laughing. They knew it couldn't happen, but it did. They didn't quite make it to 10. It only went to 11. And when it happened, my phone almost rang off the hook. People said, you're a prophet. I said, no, I'm not. I just know the people who are doing it. And it happened exactly like he said it was going to. You see, all planned in advance. Give you another illustration. I was watching Good Morning America recently. I very seldom watch the morning news, but I remember I was watching it that morning, and who do you think was being interviewed on Good Morning America? None other than George Bush Sr., Daddy Bush. And they asked him a number of questions, finally came around toward the end of the broadcast, and she said, Mr. Bush, I'd like to ask you one final question. She said, do you ever watch the morning news? He just smiled and he said, no. <laughs> you can imagine the lady's response when he said that. And she was kind of taken back for a moment or two, rather stunned. And finally she said, well, why not? His response was amazing. He said, because I already know what it's going to be. And he's exactly right. Because you see, he's one of the elitists. This is not a conspiracy. This is an agenda. You must understand something. These people know exactly what they're doing. They're not making any mistakes. It's all been planned a long time in advance. Everything in the world happens by a design plan. None of it happens by chance. It's all planned ahead of time, and they know what's going to happen. Let me give an illustration of this. And you very readily recognize this in what you've seen happen recently. American corporations spent $59.2 billion in China in the past 12 months. No, not in the United States of America, in China. Now, this is known as outsourcing. We've taken our industry and moved, moved, moved it abroad. So what has that done to jobs in the United States of America? We've lost them. The United States has lost seven million textile jobs, three million manufacturing jobs to free trade and outsourcing. You think this wasn't planned in advance? Yes, they planned years ago what they were gonna do. 152,000 companies have left the United States of America and have moved abroad. One million manufacturing jobs have been lost in the United States since President Bush took office. You think all of this is by chance? Not on your life. It's by design plan. They planned it years ago. I heard them talking about some of the things they were going to do 35 years ago when I was on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. Let's go further. The United States goes in debt to other nations at the rate of one trillion dollars per year. You think that's by chance? No, it's by design. 
It's all according to what they want. The United States must attract 17 percent of the world's capital in any given day just to service our national debt. All of this done by design plan. They never, now let's come down to where we are right now. They never purchase a successful business. Now think about it for a moment. Why would you want to go and buy something at top dollar? When do you buy it? You buy it after you bankrupt it. They only purchase after they bankrupt it. All right, now this is happening right now. The airlines of America. How do you buy them? Do you buy them when they're at their best, making their greatest profits? No, not on your life. What do you do? You take the price of crude oil to where it is today. You take the price of the jet fuel to the point that the airlines can't possibly operate. You put them into bankruptcy, and then what do you do? You buy them for pennies on the dollar? Well, that's exactly what they're doing right now. And you say, no, 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 no. That wasn't done by design plan. Yes, it was. They planned it all in advance. Why do you think they're taking the price of crude oil where it is right now and the price of gasoline at the gas pump? And the jet fuel? Sure. Well, let's go a little further. The financial institutions of the United States of America, would you buy them when they're at their best? J.P. Morgan, Chase, Bank of America, would you buy these things when they're making their greatest profits? No. What do you do? You first bankrupt them. Then you buy them for pennies on the dollar. And that's exactly what's happening in our banking institutions right now. Real estate. You think all of this is by chance? No. Ten to twelve years ago, they devised the option arm, the uh, no interest loans, and they knew at some point that it would do exactly what it has done today to the real estate market. It was planned 12 to 15 years ago to do everything that they're doing today with real estate in America. So what are they going to do? They're going to own the, the, the majority of the homes of America. And what do they pay for them? They get them for nothing. After all, when the person can't make their house payment, after three months, they come in, repossess it, and the house belongs to them. After all, the banking institutions are also going to belong to them because they're going to bankrupt them through the real estate market. How about small businesses? The identical same thing. You don't buy small businesses when they're making their greatest profit. You buy small businesses after you've already bankrupted them, and then you come in and buy them for pennies on the dollar. That's exactly what's happening by a design plan. The elite create a problem, and then they create a solution. Example, Brazil. Many years ago, Brazil wanted to be a great power. After all, they had the greatest wealth, probably, uh, of any nation on the face of the earth in the Amazon River Basin. And so what did they do? They went and said, yes, Brazil, we'll be glad to give you all of the loans that you want. We'll give you an unending line of credit. Just go ahead and build that beautiful city, Brasilia, and do all the other things you want to do. Uh, they did. Now, they knew good and well that Brazil could never succeed because, after all, the interest rates were so high. So, sure enough, you guessed it, after a few years, Brazil could not make that payment to the World Bank. What did the World Bank do? The World Bank came in and said, well, Brazil, we're sorry, but you can't make those payments. You can't even pay the interest much less the principal, and they said, I'll tell you what, we'll be glad to give you a new line of credit. All you have to do is just uh, sign on the dotted line that you will give us all of the wealth of the Amazon River Basin. Now, that is probably the wealthiest, uh, unexplored, uh, I shouldn't say unexplored, but maybe undeveloped place on the face of the earth today, gold and silver and and diamonds, and everything imaginable, and timber, and everything the world needs today. And they said, okay, we'll be glad to do that. We'll make it this time. So they said, sure, we'll sign on the dotted line. Well, what did the World Bank give them? The World Bank didn't give them anything but a computer entry. Didn't give them gold, didn't give them silver, didn't give them anything of value. Gave them a computer entry. They signed on the dotted line, said we'll use the Amazon River Basin as collateral. What happened a few years later? 
Sure enough, Brazil couldn't make it, couldn't pay back the principal nor the interest. So the World Bank came in and said, well, Brazil, tell you what do. We will just merely foreclose on what you gave us uh, as, as uh, you know, if we gave you that new line of credit. And sure enough, Brazil had no choice. Who owns today the entire Amazon River Basin? It's owned by none other than the World Bank. How did they get it? For a computer entry. You see, they created a problem, and then they created a solution, and Brazil did exactly what they just said. Now, what are they doing to the American uh, economy today? First of all, you destroy the dollar in order to bring in what? The North American Union. A new currency. Every bit of it being done by a design plan. Let me prove it to you. Here it is right here. The word is better known as inflation. Now, watch carefully. The dollar in 1950, it will only buy 12 cents today of what it would buy in the year of 1950. Uh, it has lost 88% of its value since 1950. All right. If you were my age, you would remember... Uh, when the dollar was worth exactly what it was. But instead, we have had 100% inflation since the year 1950. Let me prove it to you. A postage stamp in 1950 cost 3 cents. Today, the cost of a postage stamp is over 40 cents. What is that? That's 1,266% inflation. Did that happen by chance? <laughs> Not on your life. It happened by design plan, by the people who want to own everything in our modern day society and bring it all under control. Let's take a gallon of gas. A gallon of, 19, of 90 octane, octane gas in 1950 at a full service gasoline station cost 18 cents in 1950. Today, over $4 a gallon. Up 1,200 I mean, up 1,870%. All right, let's go again. A house in 1959 cost average $14,100. Today, that same medium-priced house cost $213,000. By chance, not on your life, by design plan. A dental crown used to cost $40. Today, it's $1,100. 2,750% inflation. An ice cream cone cost five cents. You remember those days back in 1950. Today, $2.50 for that same ice cream cone. 4,900% inflation. The average monthly government Medicare insurance premium paid by senior citizens was $5.30 in 1970. Today it is $93.50, 1,664% inflation. Several generations ago, a person worked uh, 1.4 months per year to pay their federal government income tax. Today, they work five months in order to pay the identical same income tax. Well, what am I trying to say? All right, here it is once again. I hope you're beginning to get the message because the only way that I can tell you what they told me is going to happen in the next 12 months is to give you the rest of the story so you understand the total picture. The year was 1960. I drove my automobile to a service station, not a gas station. Now notice my wording very carefully. I drove my automobile to a service station station. An attendant walks out of the station and says, how can I help you? I said, fill her up. He puts the hose in the gas tank, and while the gas tank is filling, he checks my tire pressure, he raises my hood, checks my oil level, washes my windshield, and comes back around and says, 35 cents a gallon. Now, that year, it was four quarts to the gallon. Remember that now. Gasoline, four quarts to the gallon, 1960. 2,008 
2009, we're coming into before very long, I go to a gas station, no longer a service station, there's no attendant there, they can't afford them any longer, no service, and I get out of my automobile, put my credit card into the, uh, the uh, pump, and pump my own gas over $4 a gallon, well over $4 a gallon. Now, it is still four quarts to the gallon. The gasoline has not changed in any manner whatsoever. Do you realize that you're paying proportionately the identical same thing today for a gallon of gasoline that you paid in 1960 according to the purchasing power of the American dollar? The gasoline hasn't changed at all. The gasoline is still four quarts to the gallon. The only thing that has changed is the value of the currency, the Federal Reserve note, that you purchase that gasoline with. Are you beginning to get the message? You say, all of this done by design plan? You better believe it is. They are destroying the value of the American dollar so that other nations will not use it. Now, this may be found very startling. Uh, I hope you've considered this before. Did you hear me say that other nations will not use it? You're exactly right. Why? The standard currency of the world today is crude oil. It's not the dollar. It used to be. It was as sound as the dollar years ago. Not anymore. The standard currency of the world today is crude oil. It's not the yen, neither is it the ruble, neither is it the pound, and it's not the dollar. It's crude oil. You watch where crude oil goes and you'll see where all the currencies of the world are going. Now, if they can destroy the dollar from being used as the currency to sell and trade crude oil with, they can destroy the value of the dollar. They can make America a second-rate, third-world country, and that's exactly what they're in the process of doing, is bringing the entire world into the same level, and every bit of it done by a design plan. You see, there was a time when the dollar was so sound that all the oil-producing countries in the world used the dollar as the method of the sale and the trade of crude oil. Not anymore. The world today is opting out of the dollar at such a rapid pace, it is startling. Let me give you an example. This has happened just within the past few months' time. Let's go to the words reserve currency. What is a reserve currency? A reserve currency is the currency that nations hold for a rainy day, for a tough time, maybe during war, whatever it may be. You have a reserve currency. More than likely, it's called a savings account. Now, you probably won't do this in light of what's happening in banking today, but let's say that you go down to your local bank and you say, I want to put some money into a savings account. So you do, and you keep it there for a rainy day. That's called a reserve currency. If you ever need to, you can go back and draw on it. But for the time being, you just leave it there. Now, nations have the identical same thing. They have a reserve currency. Now, always, as long as I can remember, and I'm no young fella, but as long as I can remember, uh, the American dollar has always been used by every nation on the face of the earth as a reserve currency. They could depend on it when everything else fell through the floor. They could depend on the American dollar. Not anymore. Now the dollar has devaluated to the point that the world is scared to death of our $9.345 trillion. Looks like it's going over $10 trillion debt before long. They're getting scared to death of it. They don't trust our T-bills. They don't trust uh, our uh, credit any longer. And so what's happening? The world is no longer using the American dollar as its reserve currency. They're using other currencies to depend on on a rainy day. Let me list for you the nations that within the past six months have ceased to use the American dollar as their reserve currency. Now, when the American dollar is not used as a reserve currency, what happens to the American dollar? That means they don't, it's not in circulation like it used to be. They don't use it uh, uh, any longer as that which they back up on. Here they are. I mean, th th this is a startling Think about it for a moment. When these nations no longer use the dollar as a reserve currency, that means that they don't have to buy our T-bills. They don't have to buy 
the interest on our national debt. They no longer come to the Federal Reserve auctions and, and want the American dollar as they've always wanted. Here it is. Here are the nations that within the past six months have ceased to use the American dollar as their reserve currency. China, Kuwait, Switzerland, Ecuador, Syria, Libya, South Korea, Argentina, Iran, Russia, Malaysia, Brazil, and some Balkan countries. Does that startle you? I hope it does. I hope that shakes you to reality of the fact this is being done by a design plan. It was planned years in advance. They knew exactly what they were going to do. Then, of all things, one nation jumped ship. They said, we're not going to do it any longer. We, we no longer will use the American dollar for the sale and the trade of crude oil. Now, supposedly, the largest oil field in the world is Saudi Arabia. The second largest oil field on the face of the earth is Iraq. And the third largest oil field, supposedly, on the face of the earth is Iran. And just a few months ago, Iran said, we don't want your American dollar anymore. We don't trust it. We're going to use another currency for the sale and the trade of crude oil. And the first time since crude oil had been used as our modern day method of running the world, the first country to ever do it said we will no longer use the American dollar. We're going to establish our own bank. They called it a bourse in Iran. And they said we're going to establish our own bank. They did successfully just a few months ago. Now listen to the countries who have joined Iran in no longer using the American dollar for the trail and the trade of crude oil. In fact, Iran will not even allow an American dollar to be used any longer in its country. They say we don't even want one. Definitely not for the sale and trade of crude oil. Here it is, Iran, third largest oil field in the world. Right on the heels of Iran, Venezuela, sixth percent of America's oil supply. And they said, no more American dollars. We're finished. Nigeria. Nigeria, 2.6 million barrels a day of crude oil. They said, uh-uh. We want other currencies now beside the American dollar. Bolivia. Oh, my goodness. Then came along Russia. As of November of last year, Russia equals Saudi Arabia in crude oil output. What does that mean? That merely means if Russia doesn't use the American dollar for the sale and trade of crude oil any longer, what happens to the dollar? Then OPEC came along last month and said, we are going to diversify. And we won't necessarily use the American dollar for the sale and trade of crude oil any longer either. Now, when the standard currency of the world is crude oil as it is today, and these countries will no longer use the dollar for the sale and the trade of crude oil, where does the dollar go? The dollar becomes worthless. When the dollar becomes worthless, what happens to the American public? Do you realize how all of this is affecting you, the person watching this DVD right now, and how all of this relates to your dinner table and what's going to happen to the dollar when the dollar crashes? When the oil producing countries of the world stop using the dollar, as a standard currency for the sale and the trade of crude oil, the dollar began its collapse. Now just think about it for a moment. When did the price of that crude oil begin to go up at the gas tank and manifest itself in the price that you were paying for that gallon of gasoline that you put in that tank? When? Oh, about a year and a half, two years ago. All of a sudden, the gas is still four quarts to a gallon. It never changed. What changed? The only thing that changes is the value of the currency that you buy that gallon of gas with. Now, when the dollar is no longer used for the sale and trade of crude oil, when the world's no long, the nations of the world no longer use the dollar for a rainy day as their reserve currency, what happened? You guessed it. All planned by design, every bit of it. They made us dependent on foreign oil. Then they devalued the, the dollar to where it is today, to the point that the, the other countries of the world don't want the dollar. So that brings about a collapse. When the collapse comes, what happens? 
the price of gasoline goes up to four and five and six and seven dollars a gallon at the gas pump. And every bit of it is the result of the devaluation of the American dollar because the other nations of the world don't want it. Okay. Now, I come down to the title of this DVD. How do I know these things to be true? You need to understand some of my background and what will happen in the next 12 months. It all began with me when I was just a young man in my 20s, graduated from Bible college, and went to Florida and pastored a church for 12 years. The same church, Grace Baptist Church in Hollywood, Florida. One day the Lord said, Lindsay, I want you to go to Alaska as an aviation missionary. So I did. I resigned my church and raised support and went to Alaska as a missionary. I had just arrived in the state of Alaska and I heard them announce they were going to build the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. Biggest pipe ever constructed on the face of the earth for the carrying of crude oil. 800 miles long, 4 feet in diameter, and they said that 25,000 pipeliners were going to converge on the state of Alaska to build that pipeline. Now back in those days, I didn't know much. I, I was brought up in a Christian home, very godly environment, and all of a sudden, I'm thrown into the midst of a whole new world. I knew nothing about the elite. I knew nothing about the agenda of the powers that be. And so as a result, here I was, all of a sudden, to be put into a completely new environment. Well, I remember that I went to Alaska Pipeline Service Company, and I said, don't you need a chaplain on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline? They said, well, we wouldn't know what to do with you. We never had a chaplain on a pipeline before. And so I kept going back and back and back. I guess persistence paid off. And finally they said, okay, we'll give you the northern seven work camps from Prudhoe Bray down to Galbraith Lake. Just go up there and see what you can do. Well, I did. And about six months later, I'm quite sure they thought I'd quit in short order, but about six months later, Mr. R.H. King, personnel relations man with Alaska, came to me and he said, Chaplain, you're saving us thousands of dollars of counseling fees. We never knew the value of a chaplain on a pipeline before. He said, we have just voted to give you executive status. Well, I said, Mr. King, what do you mean? He said, well, you can go any place you'd like, see anything you'd like to see. And he said, we'll give you your own vehicle, and you can travel about as you will. He said, you can stay in executive dorms when you're at Prudhoe Bay. And I said, well, that's right, 40 of you. And he said, we would like to invite you to sit in on our board meetings in an advisory capacity in order to help the relationship between management and labor. I had not the slightest idea of what I was getting into. If someone had asked me when I went to Alaska, Lindsay Williams, do you believe there's a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world? I would have laughed at them and said, who are you, a John Bircher? If someone had asked me three years later, after my experience on the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline of living with the people who control the world, of sitting with the elite who are planning all of these things that I've just talked about. If someone had asked me, Chaplain Williams, do you believe there's a group of people on the face of the earth who tell the president what to do, who dictate to Congress what bills to pass, who tell the Arabs in any given day what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil and control the currencies of the world, I would have said, not only do I believe it, I sat and listened to them talk about it. As a result, by the providence of God. Now, there is no way in this world that a little insignificant, unknown missionary flying airplanes out in the bush, bush of Alaska could have ever sat and rubbed shoulders with the elite of the world except by the providence of God. Because I'm just an ordinary man like everybody else. But I had the opportunity to meet the people who control the world. As a result, when the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline was over, I felt that I had a moral obligation to tell the world what I knew. And so I wrote my book, The Energy Non Crisis. I gave name, dates, and places. I talked about those I had met. I told about things that might have wanted to be said and might not have wanted to be said. And here I am 35 years later. 
I won the world 35 years ago, you're going to be paying what you're paying today at the gas pump for a gallon of gasoline. I tried to tell people years ago that the elite control the world and that this is not a conspiracy. I've been called a conspiratorialist many times. I'm not. You see, my book, Energy Non-Crisis, someone asked me the other day, they said, why don't you have a glossary in that book where you tell where you got your information from? You know, most authors put a glossary in the back of the book, and in it they list all the references of where they got their material. I said, the reason I don't have a glossary in my book, Energy Non-Crisis, is because I didn't go and read somebody else's book and then write it and tell about what I thought they were saying. I didn't collect material from here and yon. I said, my story is a story that I lived. I tell in my six books, and I've written six, Energy Non Crisis was a bestseller, and I tell in that book only what I lived and experienced and saw as first hand. And now, 35 years later, I have tried to tell people that the elitists of the world were gonna bring America down to the status of a third world country. I've tried to warn you that the American dollar is going to collapse. I've done everything in my power. I've spoken in every state in America with the exception of Maine. I've lectured in many foreign countries. I've been on thousands of radio talk shows. And for these 35 years, I have tried every way possible to tell the American people what is happening today. Someone said the other day, a talk show host, he called and he said, Lindsay, how are things going? And I told him. And he said, Lindsay, you were the first person to ever come on my show and say that the price of gasoline was going to three and four dollars a gallon. He said, everything that you have said for the past few years has taken place exactly like you said it. I said, I'm no prophet. I said, the only reason I knew those things is because I know the people who are doing it. They told me years ago what they were going to do, and I still have contact with some of them. Twice over these 35 years, I must admit to you that I have been threatened. And people have said, you can say this, and you can't say that. Well, recently, I received the most startling phone call I've ever had in my entire life. On the other end of the line was a person that I knew, I knew him well years ago. Haven't seen him for quite some time. He greeted me on the phone, and I said, good to hear from you. He said, Lindsay, you've, you've gone too far. Now, I have known for years that there was a line out there. And I knew that if I crossed that line, I was in trouble. I also knew that if I stepped up to that line and didn't cross it, that everything would be okay. Well, I did. I guess I crossed it. And this person said, Lindsay, there are certain things that you can't say anymore. You can say this and this and this and this, and you can't say this and this and this and this any longer. Well, when he told me what the alternative was to continue saying those things, I decided that the best thing to do was quit saying them. And so I said, fine, within 24 hours time, I'll close down my website. I'll no longer make available my Energy Non-Crisis DVD. And I did. I kept my word. I did exactly what I'd been requested to do. After all, you don't ever argue with the elite, not even the President of the United States of America or some congressman. You see, the congressmen are bought anyway. And so when they're told to do something, they do it. Why do you think they hop to so quickly? Well, because they know the alternative if they don't. And so I did. I did everything they said. In 24 hours' time, it was all done. I decided the phone call went quite well, and I decided, well, it's time to ask a few questions. And I was very glad I did. Uh, the individual on the other end of the line was very friendly became very friendly when I agreed to do what they said to do. And I asked about this and that, past life, and where they'd been over the past few years. And at that, time, at that point, the individual became very polite. So I decided it was time to ask some further questions and see if he would answer me. I said, by the way, 
the price of crude oil is really affecting the American economy. And people are hurting at the gas pump with the price of gasoline today. I said, would you mind telling me where it's going? Okay, you asked for it. That's the reason you purchased this DVD. That's the reason you're watching it right now. You want to know what's going to happen in the next 12 months. So I'm going to tell you, because I've been given permission to. I wouldn't dare say it if I had not called back first and asked if I could, and I did. So here it is. You are going to pay more at the gas pump for a gallon of gasoline. In fact, by the end of the next few months, you will probably be paying a dollar more per gallon. Where is it going to go to? Now, this individual didn't say just how high it was going, but I would guess from what was intimated that $150, maybe even $200 a barrel is not exorbitant. It is going to go there. But then something so startling that you must think this through. At this point, this individual said, the price of a barrel of crude oil is going to $50 a barrel. Oh, I know. That's exactly what a radio talk show host asked me the other day when they called and asked me to be on a show, and I said, I can't do it. He said, say that again. I said, five, zero, dollars, $50 a barrel. He said, wait a minute. Are you sure you're saying this right? Now, folks, think about the ramifications of this. From where it is right now to $50 a barrel, do you know what this is going to do to the world? Oh, you say, this is wonderful. It's going to bring the price of gasoline at the gas pump down to $2.50 a gallon. Now, wait a minute. You better think past that $2.50 a gallon. So the first question I asked was, $50 a barrel? How? Oh, yes. It's all planned. Already in the works. Oh, he said, yeah. He said, how, you say, how are we going to do it? You ready? Now, I, I mean, the, the, folks, I hope you're thinking now. At this point, I hope you're sitting on the edge of your chair. He said, we're going to bring on two major oil fields in the world. Oh, I, I, immediately you would think, well, they're going to do it in America, wouldn't you? No, not in America. Neither one of them are in America. I said, you mean you're going to flood the world with cheap oil and bring it down to $50 a barrel? Yes. And I said, would you mind telling me where these oil fields are? Oh, he said, don't mind at all. Folks, it's already planned. It's already in the works. The elite of the world have already declared that they are going to do it. It's something that has been designed in advance. He said, we're going to bring on an oil field in Indonesia and one north of Russia. Now, think about it for a moment. The next day, the next day after this, the CEO of Exxon Mobil said on national news, Crude oil should be $50 a barrel. Now, how do both of these people know it? Why did he say it over national news? Because, you see, they tell you in advance everything that they're, they're going to do. It's just that the average American doesn't know how to understand their buzzwords. So he said it's going to go to $50 a barrel. Now, this is no secret. The the CEO of ExxonMobil, and last year Exxon made the largest profit of any corporation on the face of the earth in the history of the world. And the CEO of ExxonMobil said it over national news in the United States of America. It was heard by millions of people. He said the price of crude oil should be $50 a barrel. How does he know it? Now, America will be kept energy independent on foreign oil. They will not be opening up American oil fields. They will open up other oil fields. And so I said, how are you going to do this? Well, I wish I had a date. I wish I could honestly say exactly when they're going to do it, but I can't. 
But I can tell you this. They're not going to allow the huge oil fields that we know that are in America to be brought on because they want to keep us, in, keep us dependent on foreign oil and collapse the American dollar. Then, the following day, after that was said by the CEO of ExxonMobil, the retired CEO of Shell Oil, I'm going to give you the date on this one. You go look it up for yourself. The retired CEO of Shell Oil said in the Wall Street Journal, now this is not Lindsey Williams talking, but it's verification of what I was told just a few days earlier. The retired CEO of Shell Oil said in the Wall Street Journal on Monday, June the 2nd, now you go look it up for yourself. He said, quote, America must have a new energy policy. But he didn't say what that energy policy was. And oh, by the way, he has gone to work for the President of the United States of America in his cabinet. What kind of an energy policy are they going to develop? They're going to develop an energy policy that they already have planned. So the next question I asked was, why are you going to bring the price of a barrel of crude oil to $50 a barrel? You ready? That's going to start it. I hope you're thinking this through. You are going to go back and look this over many times after you have seen it. Because the first thing Americans think, $2.50 a gallon at the gas pump. Uh-uh. It goes much deeper than that. Now think back for a moment. Back in 1984, when I was told the price of a barrel of crude oil was going from $32 a barrel to 10 what did it do to the Middle East? You're right. They had built their economy on $32 a barrel. And when it went to $10 a barrel, it devastated the Arabs. It devastated the Middle East. Now, when the barrel of oil goes from where it is today to $50 a barrel, what's going to happen? It will destroy the Arabs. It will destroy the Middle East economy. So the first thing that came to my mind was, I said, sir, that beautiful five-star city that they're building over in Dubai. Now, what's going to happen to it? Well, I'll put it in my own words. Uh, my words are a ghost town. He explained it other ways. He said to me, he said, Lindsay, you don't understand the Arab mentality. I said, what are you talking about? He went on for 10 to 15 minutes to explain to me how the Arab world thinks. Now, you see, America at one time, the American dollar was the standard currency of the world. At one time, it was as sound as the dollar. At one time, almost every nation on the face of the earth used the American dollar as their reserve currency. What's happening today? Nations are opting out of using it, the reserve currency. They don't use it for the sale and trade of crude oil, except certain nations anymore. So what are they doing? They're breaking America. They're destroying your lifestyle and mine, all by design plan. You think they would have any qualms about doing the same thing to the Arabs? They made them. A hundred years ago, they were nomads roaming the deserts riding camels. What are they today? They're the wealthiest people on the face of the earth. Well, why shouldn't they do the same thing to them that they did to America? After all, they break them and turn around and make other nations the greatest nations on the face of the earth. So mark my words. You are going to see a destruction of the Arab culture by a design that is planned in advance. And when they take it to $50 a barrel, what's going to happen? This man said to me, he said, there's one thing that really bothers us. He said, Iran. <laughs> Have you seen Iran in the news lately? He said, Iran really bothers us. And I said, why? He said, they're becoming the richest nation on the face of the earth. Iran has to go. Why? After all, they're becoming too powerful. They have bucked the internationalists. They have successfully stopped using the American dollar. Well... Mark my words, and this is just kind of a prediction based on what he said, even though he didn't say what they were going to do. Just before the election, something's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to be. Uh, I don't 
know whether they'll succeed in taking it to $50 a barrel before the election or not. I rather doubt that. I think it'll probably take them longer to do that, to bring on those two oil fields. But just before the election, you're going to see something happen because this individual said to me, John McCain is our man. He will become the next president of the United States of America. If they succeed, John McCain will be the next president of the United States of America. It's already planned. Now, what are the ramifications of this? Do you have the slightest idea what's going to happen when the Arab world sees a collapse because it goes to $50 a barrel? Oh, yes, you'll probably see $2.50 a gallon at the gas pump here in America. But do you have the slightest idea of what's going to happen when the Arabs no longer buy our T-bills, which purchase our national debt and the interest of that debt of nine to ten trillion dollars and when nobody comes in and buys the Federal Reserve issues and T-bills and bonds anymore, do you realize what's going to happen to the American dollar and the economy of the United States of America? You'll wish for four and five and six dollars a gallon at the gas pump and gas to be back where it is right now rather than a collapse of the American dollar because you won't have anything to buy it with. A person said to me the other day when I said the American dollar is going to collapse, he said never. He said, we would never stand for that. I happened to be at a seminar speaking in Panama at the time. And this individual said, we'd never stand for that. I said, yes, you will. He said, when? I said, when you go to the, uh, when you have to take a wheelbarrow load of American dollars to the grocery store to buy a loaf of bread, I said, you'll beg for a new currency. And they'll give it to you. They'll be standing on the doorstep waiting, the Federal Reserve will, to give you a new currency with more than likely an exchange. Now, what is the ramifications of $50 a barrel on crude oil? It will devastate. It will be catastrophic. It literally will destroy the Arab world as we know it today, and the reserve currency of the American dollar will utterly collapse the dollar because the world will not need it, the Arabs and other countries will opt out of the dollar. They'll buy gold, they'll buy silver, they'll buy land, they'll buy anything they can buy. They will dump the dollar on the world's market overnight. And as a result, you will be begging for a different lifestyle than what you have right now because of the position you'll be in. Folks, do you realize what is planned for you and for me? America, oh, I, I must give this, then I'm going to quit. This individual said to me, at some point, America is going to see a financial collapse. And he said it will be so severe that it will take years for the American economy to come out again. You see, it's all planned. When they devastated the housing market, beginning 15 years ago with option arms and interest only and Go buy that new house and take your equity out of your present one. When, when they devalued the American dollar and Iran established their borders, every bit of this was one more step of bringing America to the point where they want it, to a financial collapse. And years to come, you'll look back on this DVD that you're watching right now, and you'll say, Lindsay, you told it like it was for 35 years, as that talk show host said the other day. And I'm going to say, uh-uh. I'm just a mere person that puts on my britches every morning just like you do. And only by the providence of God did I happen to know the elite, the people who are doing it. And they tell me what their plans are. And I merely tell you. There were times that I was laughed at on radio talk shows. For about the last five or six years, I haven't had a single heckler. Why? Because everything that the elite told me years ago has come to pass exactly like they said it. And now, I'm trying to warn you so that you can do something about it. And it all goes back to the one thing that you can depend on. When everything else fails, there's one thing in this world that is true. It's the Word of God, the Bible. And the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 32, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth will scare you to death. <laughs> no, no, that's not what it says at all. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, And ye shall know the truth, 
and the truth will set you free. Now, if you take these things to heart, if you know what they're going to do, the truth will set you free. So I'm going to offer some suggestions, if I may, based on my many years of living, based on knowing the elite and living with them for a period of time. I would highly recommend that you set your spiritual house in order immediately. If you don't know where you stand spiritually, you see, a house that's built upon a rock will stand. A house that's built upon sinking sand, the foundation will be washed out when the floods come. Personally, me, Lindsay Williams, I am a born-again Christian. I have trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. May I very highly recommend that you read Romans chapter 10 in the Bible, verses 8 through 13, and you will find out how to settle your position spiritually with the Lord. But I must quote one more verse. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't buy it. There's no way that you could ever afford to purchase your salvation. But you can have it free of charge. By going and repenting of your sins and placing your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, read God's Word and let it become the greatest part of your life. Have your, your, your home on a solid rock of Christ Jesus and know God's word and you will be able to stand when these things happen and it won't destroy your home and your family will stay together because there are plans in the work by the elite for you and me and you mark my words a year from now when you see this happen what is going to happen in the next 12 months that's what I've tried to tell you so in light of all of this just a few other suggestions Plant a garden. That's right. Simple thing. But you'd be surprised how you might be glad that you did. Get out of debt. Don't, 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 go, don't go and take the equity out of that house any longer. Get out of debt and, and get yourself right. Listen to their buzz words. This is so important. One of the first things I learned when I lived with the elite is to listen to their buzz words. You see... I don't know how to explain it except to say that the elite of the world have a moral code. Now understand that I've been a pastor of a church for 12 years prior to going to Alaska as a missionary. So I had a lot of counseling experiences. I had taken psychiatry in college and I got a bachelor's degree in Bible. And all of this, I had to learn how to analyze people. And as a result, I had an opportunity to sit across the table and live in the dorms with the elite of the world, I had an opportunity to, to listen to what they had to say. They have a moral code. These people aren't, uh, aren't wicked. They have a moral code. Let me tell you one thing about their moral code. They are required, and they have a different moral code than the moral code of the Bible, in general, most of them. But they, in their moral code, they must tell you everything that they're going to do. They're required by their God to tell you what they're going to do. They did. Let me give you an example. You, you'll, re you'll remember this one. New Orleans, Louisiana. Katrina. Two weeks prior to Katrina, what did you see on the television? That's right. It was a movie. They prepared it. What was it? It was called Oral Storm. I have a copy of it right here. Yeah, you guessed it. What did they do in Oil Storm? They told you everything they were going to do. It showed on cable. It showed on many of the networks across America. It was a one-hour presentation. And it almost was identical to where the pattern of that hurricane followed and everything that happened. They told you two weeks in advance what they were going to do. You say, you mean to tell me that these people have a moral code? They sure do. If you can know how to listen to their buzzwords, New world order. You think that meant anything? 
You better believe it meant something to Daddy Bush. Read my lips. What was he telling you? He was telling you to listen to what he was saying. A thousand points of light. He told you everything he was going to do. Did you know how to interpret what he was saying? No, you didn't. Did I? Sure. I lived with him for three years. I know how to analyze these people. Let's go back a ways. These people aren't uh, atheists. I found some of them to be very moral people. I never knew one of them to get drunk. I, f I saw very few of them smoke a cigarette. They were very moral in their living. Uh, but this, this happened from the beginning. Remember, in the beginning, uh, there were two boys, the first ones that were born. One was called Cain, one was called Abel. What did they do when they got a little older? Both of them worshipped God. They both built an altar. They both brought a sacrifice to God. Now, the Bible says that Cain was the son of perdition, the son of the devil. And that Abel was a worshiper of the true and living God. But they both were religious. These people are religious. God bless America. How many times have you heard that in the past eight years? These people are very religious. Sure they are. But you see, so was Cain. But the only difference was Cain brought the most beautiful offering you could ever imagine. He brought flowers and herbs and fruit. And he placed them on an altar. And he offered them up as a sacrifice unto God. What did Abel bring? Abel brought a lamb. And he slaughtered it. He cut its throat. The blood came out. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The Bible says that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the supreme sacrifice to be able to save your soul and mine. And Abel knew that. And so he brought a sacrifice that God would accept. What did God do with Cain? God said, Cain, I can't accept your sacrifice. You're trying to get there by works. You're trying to get there by religion. You're trying to get there by being good. You're trying to get there by joining the church. You're not trying to get here by the grace of God. You, you're not trusting me by faith. You remember that verse back there again? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You, you, you can't join this and join that and do this and that, do that to get to heaven. How, how do you find salvation? You find it through the method that Abel brought before God, the one who paid the sacrifice on the cross 2,000 years ago to purchase your redemption and mine. And you see, they both were religious. Both the elite are religious. They used to come to my worship services at Fruit Obey. Sure they did. I've seen them sitting in the audience. Uh, I knew who they were. They knew me. And one of them said to me one day, he said, Chaplain, we appreciate everything you did for us up there. God bless you and your work. God bless America. <laughs> Cain, perfect Cain, works, works, works. How, how do you find eternal life? You find it through the grace of God. Repent of your sins and place your faith in what Christ did for you on the cross. Here is Cain, here is Abel, here is the elitist, here is the born-again Christian. Perfect picture from the very beginning. And today we see the same thing today. Most politicians are bought and paid for. There are a few up there that aren't. Let me just give an example. Can you imagine working for a company that has a little more than 500 employees and they have the following statistics of record? <laughs> this one you're going to enjoy. Now, imagine now, 500 employees, can you imagine working for this company, and the following statistics about them. 29 have been accused of spouse abuse. 7 have been arrested for fraud. 19 have been accused of writing bad checks. 117 have directly or indirectly bankrupted at least two businesses. 3 have done time for assault. 71 cannot get a credit card due to bad credit. 14 have been arrested 
on drug-related charges. Eight have been arrested for shoplifting. Twenty-one are currently defendants in lawsuits. Eighty-four have been arrested for drunk driving in the last year. Now, would you want to work for a company like that? You know who that is? You guessed it. It's none other than the United States Congress of the United States of America. Startling? Go look up the records for yourself. Well, I have to come down to this one. If you had lived in 19 and 29, just prior to the Great Depression, 1928, let's say, and you had known that in 1929 the Great Depression was going to take place, would you have done anything in preparation? Sure. If you had lived in Europe before World War I and World War II and had known they were going to take place, would you have stayed there? No. If you had worked in the Twin Towers before 9-11 and you knew that on 9-11 the Twin Towers were going to come down, would you have gone to work that morning? If you had lived in New Orleans just before Katrina and you had known what was going to happen, would you have stayed there? Well, let me sum it up one last way. If you had lived 2,000 years ago, just before the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem's manger, and you had known the very night and the place that the Savior of the world was going to be born, would you have joined those shepherds that night? I've tried to tell you the best I can. I've tried to let you know what's going to happen in the next 12 months. Now it's up to you. Go do something about it. And I think that you can spare your dinner table. You can set your spiritual house in order right now. Right in front of your television as you're watching this on your knees. You can settle it. So for what is worth this is what I have received from the elitist that can be expected in the next 12 months in this world.